Hi, everybody. It's Jody, and welcome to the Barcoding Huddle. I'm your host, Jody Costa. I'm the VP of Marketing for Barcoding Incorporated, and I'm thrilled that you're joining us for this video today. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to ask my guests to go ahead and join me on camera and take yourself off of mute if you are on there so you have um, so we can listen to you. Uh, so thank you for joining me again. We're here today to talk about the future. The future is now with Honeywell, and we're really pleased that we are able to do this recording and, and kind of have this great conversation. I, I really can't wait to dig in, so I'm going to try to blow through this introduction quick. Um, so Honeywell, we are sitting down with Honeywell's productivity solutions and services business, and they create mobile computers, printers, and data capture devices that improve worker productivity in thousands of companies all of all sizes all over the world. Um, they're also a great partner of ours, and we've, we've really appreciated all the, the wonderful deployments we've done together over the years. They helped pioneer the barcode scanning market back in the 70s, which is near and dear to our hearts because it's formed our business. Um, and now it's new innovations help re retailers, distribution centers, transportation and logistics providers, and healthcare organizations achieve significant improvements in efficiency, speed, and accuracy in their operations. Um, obviously, super important stuff, and that's exactly where we want to go with this conversation today. Uh, we want to talk about the future, and we have the right people on the line with us um, and can't wait to dive in. So first and foremost, Taylor Smith, thank you so much for being with us. Taylor is the Chief Technology Officer for Honeywell Productivity Solutions and Services, and um, can't wait to have you on the call. Thank you for being here. Great. Thanks, why Jody. Excited to yeah, be here. Yeah, why don't you give us a your, you know, your your quick and dirty intro and who you are and sure. So so as you mentioned, kind of chief technology officer for productivity solutions and services, uh, based in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, been with Honeywell really since the Metrologic acquisition, which was back in 2008. So they acquired uh, one of the leaders in laser-based barcode scanning at the time, Metrologic. And most of my career has been in uh, product management, uh, general kind of smaller business leadership roles, and chief marketing officer for the same PSS business group here. But uh, recently over the last year, I've had the great opportunity um, and I guess professional expansion to lead our global engineering team here uh, as CTO. And so it's been a, a great opportunity. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thanks. Also with us today, GW Hall, dear friend, fellow volleyball player, and our channel business manager. Uh, GW, how about an intro? Sure. Um, you know, I'll start off with, I've been in the AABC space for the last 15 years, last five being with Honeywell. I've held three different roles here, uh, everything from sales to new account development to now uh, a CBM managing the, the barcoding relationship. Uh, yes, and a former volleyball player a long, long time. <laughs> uh, but looking forward to the, you know to go through this discussion today as uh, you know the, the hear the future of of where Honeywell is going. Yeah, you know I have to throw that in there yeah. every time. <laughs> <laughs> every time, every time. So once again, I'm Jody with Barcoding Inc. Barcoding Inc. is a supply chain automation and innovation company dedicated to helping organizations achieve efficiency, accuracy, and connectivity. Obviously, with that said, you can see why our partnership with Honeywell is so great. Um, but I want to dive right in. So Taylor, you know, you've had a lot of, of tenure at Honeywell. Um, so congrats to you. Uh, but I'm just kind of curious right off the bat, kind of what stands out to you in, in terms of how you've seen Honeywell grow? Um, you know, what, what have you seen in your, in your time there? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really been interesting. And if I kind of think of kind of one or two key words that would try and sum up my, my career and experience at Honeywell and Honeywell itself, I would say kind of change or adaptability. I mean, e even myself, um, one of the reasons that excites me in being part of Honeywell uh, for so long is I don't think I've had the same role for more than two or three years here. Like, yeah. You can kind of get in there. Um, accomplish, set a mark, and if you're performing well, you're given new opportunities, whether it's uh, within a business or moving over functionally or, or kind of growing up in a new function. But we take that kind of same internal personnel and employee development to kind of the approach of the external world when it comes to growth, change, adaptability. And it's amazing to see the types of 
new offerings that we come out with, broadly speaking, to Honeywell to address market needs. Um, I mean, just take, for example, the pandemic that we've been going through the last few years, a, oh, a whole yeah. new set of solutions that Honeywell, broadly speaking, has brought to market. Uh, we continue to look at acquiring new organizations to broaden our portfolio, again, across all businesses. That's exciting to see the new types of technology we bring in that are driving new kind of fundamental macro trends, whether it's health or sustainability or environmental uh, productivity in our division. So to me, it's really being able to respond to those macro trends and not getting stuck in a, a single portfolio, but listening to the market, listening to the customers and, and driving a kind of ever-changing portfolio direction. It's really exciting that Honeywell provides that kind of development. And I think that's super relevant to today's world. I mean, obviously, if you're kind of living that internally, that's going to help you as uh, as you work with other organizations who are facing those challenges. GW, have you have you felt a similar experience? Um, you want to talk about kind of your kind of that, that internal uh, life at Honeywell and how it relates to how you can better serve your customers? Sure. You know, when I was hired on at Honeywell, I came in in an account development role. So as we were looking for new accounts that that fit the solutions we were selling to, to broaden the, the the customer base. So I spent uh, over a year in that role. And then when we looked to, to make some changes to better service both our partners, our end users, and, and bring these products to market, you know, I took a, a different position in the sales, sales arena. And now as I've moved over into uh, the partner side of this and, and working with, with our partners, uh, I'm able to bring not only uh, the training perspectives and, and what, you know, the direction of Honeywell, but also work with, with individual sales reps and, and help them get into, you know, what the product sets and features are, what's important to our customers. So, you know, the multiple roles for me, I feel has made me better at the current role that I'm, that I'm in now and a, a larger asset to the partner community. So uh, very similar experiences, Taylor, not to the level of Taylor, but uh, <laughs> I've enjoyed the, you know, the, the having wearing multiple hats and in, uh, in my career here at Honeywell. So. That's awesome. I mean, I mean, this the strength of any organization is their people, right? So I think it's great to hear. And um, I'm obviously all of us at Barcoding, you know, appreciate both of you and as we support our joint customers out there. Um, but I, you know, Taylor, you're, you know, relatively new to the role of chief technology officer, but I, I really am fascinated because obviously a lot of our, our customers organizations have this similar role. So I'm kind of wondering what you're what you're experiencing so far as a CTO and and kind of what you're seeing that might be impacting other CTOs out there. Yeah, I mean, I I took this position at an interesting time. <laughs> you so did, you did. Kind of March March or April of last year, right? So we we thought the world was great and recovering, everyone bouncing back from COVID. Um, I think kind of a lot of the industry in general, kind of growing and booming. And then a semiconductor global supply shortage hit. And so my guess is any CTO that is involved with any sort of kind of hardware products, whether mm -hmm. it's electronics, frankly, even mechanical stuff with steel and other metal shortages that they're experiencing unprecedented supply chain shortages. And that's really been kind of my experience and exposure over the last year is how to rapidly address that um, cross-functionally like throughout Honeywell and, and really what I thought was going to be maybe four to six weeks of kind of daily meetings has now been going on a year um, right. where we have global teams together from our sourcing supply chain and engineering we have facilities in the U.S. and China so it's kind of morning meetings one night night meetings the next night um, but really making sure we get those cross-functional teams together and, and taking kind of a three-pronged approach of how are we pulling in supply and leveraging our sourcing relationships? How are we redesigning products? And that's kind of where my team comes in to look at secondary source components that are available. And then how are we working with sales and partners like barcoding to look at SKU substitution? Like typically in the past, customers or partners would say, this is the SKU I want to order. And they'd wait for it and be easy to deliver. Mm -hmm. Now there's a much more kind of receptive nature to say, well, all right, if that's not the exact SKU, as long as it does the base functionality that I'm requiring, I'll be willing to look at a substitution and shift. So it's really that three-pronged strategy, but 
I mean, the level of redesign activities that, that we are pushing forward, as well as continuing to drive innovation and new product development uh, is really unprecedented. And what I'd say has been kind of a key focus of mine, um, which we can talk about other things as yeah. well, but. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I'd love to know kind of how do you guys um, research and how do you develop the, the plans for those types of redesigns? I mean, obviously we're coming out of a disruptive and still disrupted time. Yeah. Um, so these are these are different challenges than maybe CTO has had in the past or someone in your role had in the past. So what are you thinking about now, though? How do you make those decisions? Yeah, I mean, given the shortages, it's it's actually a pretty easy decision. It's, <laughs> It's starting back with, well, what can I get? Because redesigning from a limited chip or component to another chip or component that's still going to take 30, 40, 50 weeks doesn't help. Um, so it's really starting first with our sourcing engagements and saying, okay, this is the part or set of parts that we need. What can we get today? Or what can we get in four weeks? And then I challenge our engineering team to say, okay, make those parts work. <laughs> I mean, that, that's really kind of how Apollo 13 at. right there. <laughs> yes, great, great reference there on that one. But, um, but while we're doing that, I mean, we have to keep the customer in mind. So we're doing a lot of things to make sure that the traditional kind of three Fs, form, fit, and function are not changing. And if mm -hmm. they are, I mean, we're trying to make sure we make the appropriate trade-offs, the appropriate customer communication, um, to notify customers of that. And if it changes enough, then we may even look at different SKU releases to signify that. But we've seen, again, lots of customer willingness and partnership through this time that even if certain functionality um, is removed or deprecated, moved to a new SKU, a lot of customers are still switching there because it, it may not be a piece of um, feature set or function that every customer really needs. Yeah, I mean, I think you started with that concept of flexibility, and I think flexibility, collaboration, if you're not talking about those things, when you're talking about tech in this world, you're probably missing the boat, right? And I'm yeah. sure, GW, you have these conversations, um, you know, as your experience uh, working with end users and partners been probably pretty similar. I mean, we, we help guide those conversations, right? Absolutely. If we're not guiding, and we're not taking the, the, the ability to look at what can we use because of what is coming and what is available? You know, the lead times are long. They're long across all industries right now. So the, the lead time conversations where we'd have them in the past and it would be, okay, I'm going to try something else. Well, now we're bringing other things forward so you can still hit your go live dates. You can, you can, you know, service your end customers as well as you know you're our end customer you have to service your own end customers so mm -hmm. bring different options forward is important for everybody throughout the whole process so you know these conversations are much easier to have you know in this time period than they were to have three or four years ago where you know customers in all, all the way across the chain were not open to have them in so it is changing. I mean, we're, we're really spending a lot of time making sure we're showing what's out there. What else can we do? And, uh, you know, some of the products that have come have been absolutely incredible uh, through Taylor and his team of what they've been able to bring to market. Well, yeah, I mean, I know that barcoding, we appreciate Honeywell's leadership um, through times like this and um, appreciate you guys helping us set those proper expectations and getting and use our customers what they need uh, so that they can keep doing what they do and get us all of our good stuff that we keep ordering because <laughs> all of us just keep ordering, right? So, um, but but GW, a great segue because I do want to get right to, you know, kind of the heart of this and that's Honeywell's great product line. Um, so I, I think maybe where I'll start, Taylor, is just kind of maybe a, a little snapshot of what you're really excited about here in the very in, in, in immediate short term and then we'll start to pivot into that longer term look. Okay. I mean, everyone probably has a difference of what short term means. I'll, uh, yeah. I'll look I'm at gonna leave that. it open. So you yeah, can just I'll, I'll look at it. that three to six month window. Um, and, and so what I'm really excited about is uh, kind of a new collaborative kind of software platform that we are doing with our business, as well as what we call uh, HCE, Honeywell Connected Enterprise, which was a kind of business that we formed probably three or four years back inside Honeywell to be a little bit more of a, a software center of excellence as we try and shift our overall 
business to become kind of a industrial software enterprise software provider. Um, and so that offering, uh, which we're currently terming as connected worker or worker performance, mm -hmm. I'm super excited about because if you look at and consider uh, the average kind of worker in a warehouse or supply chain environment, that, that's our first target market there. There's lots of solutions out there for managing what we call the planned or structured work. And we have some of it, like some of yeah. our voice, our voice directed picking solutions. That's what we would call kind of planned or structured work. You know how many orders you have to pick that day, how many workers you have, et cetera. Let's say that's 80 to 85% of the work that gets done. There's that other kind of 20, 15%, that's what we call unplanned or unstructured. Like what happens when a bunch of pallets topple over and you need to clean them up? What happens when a shipment arrives all damaged and you have to do a audit control? Uh, what happens when printers start um, needing print head replacements? How do you make sure you're coordinating that? What happens when a forklift truck in a warehouse, either its battery runs out or you know that it needs a battery replacement, but you have to coordinate to make sure the technicians there at the centralized station to replace the battery. All of those little things and talking to customers we found have added up and really distract, not so much the productivity, it is productivity at the end, but really the utilization of mm -hmm. the employees. Um, and so we are, as I mentioned, working with HCE to come out with this worker performance offering that allows companies to digitize that last kind of set of employee and worker tasks uh, to be able to have a full digital view and full analytics into what their workforce is doing and how to optimally respond, close the loop, and, and understand where time is being spent to get to that next level of productivity, given that labor shortages are, are such a problem kind of cross industry right now. Oh, we, yes, we are hearing it from all angles. Uh, barcoding actually did some informal kind of voice of the customer research at Modex, the big material handling show here in 2022. And, you know, process and people, right? These things keep coming up over and over and over again as kind of the main challenges. And of course they're interrelated, um, but we can't, we can't really have any conversation around warehouse distribution, retail, transportation, any of these seg sectors without talking about labor. So it's exciting to think about how you guys are starting to think of that whole person. Um, you mentioned structured and unstructured. I mean, when you said unstructured, I, I thought that's just life. That's just everyday <laughs> life. <Yeah. laughs> yeah. um, so it's kind of amazing to me that, you know, we're now getting to that point where we are looking at those as being just as vital as those structured and planned tasks. So that's, that's great stuff coming from Honeywell. GW, yeah. I'll let you comment too, if you want to jump in. Yeah, you know, Taylor, one of the questions I was going to ask you was, you know, with the, the warehouse worker shortage, you know, how do you see technology helping with this, you know, and, and just hearing right now the ability that we are looking at this, that unstructured part, but how, could you expand on that, the, like, you know, as we look at new technologies? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, if we consider kind of the warehouse environment, I mean, look, there's there's a full spectrum of where customers are in their, whether it's digitization, automation journey, kind of whatever you want to call that. But I mean, clearly labor is a challenge. And as we look at technology advancements, I view it as kind of two potential options. One is how do you make the worker more efficient? Mm -hmm. And then the second is potentially how can you completely replace the worker so that Again, if, if there's a labor shortage or could they be reallocated to some other task or activity? And that's really where automation comes in. And that's where I think Honeywell is, is a little unique where I mean, we have our, our core software offerings, we have the edge products and devices that enable workers, and we have a multi-billion dollar automation division specializing in warehouse automation from conveyor, sortation, uh, ASRS, uh, robotic arms and things of that nature. And that, that's where I would really say uh, Honeywell looks to the technology is kind of on those two paths is full-blown automation, as well as kind of enhancement of the kind of people-based and, and manual-based uh, workforce. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, do you have a sense of, um, you know, because people will say modern workforce or we talk about automation. And I think our experience on the barcoding side is that there's a very large spectrum of what that means to people and probably what people, what organizations are probably capable of handling. Um, so do you guys have a sense of, of what that spectrum looks like in your opinion um, and, and what maybe a modern warehouse in 2022 would be? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I think maybe we haven't uh, codified it in some nice marketing material and I'll give you kind of a little bit of my opinion, but I mean, if you just take a single workflow, as an example, picking an order. I mean, clearly the lowest level of automation is paper. And look, there's still probably a large percentage of warehouses that operate at that level, which is mm -hmm. shocking and surprising. And which is also why I'm not overly concerned with kind of the industry moving completely peopleless over the next five or 10 years, the fact that we still have many distribution centers on paper. I but agree. even inside picking, you could go from paper to call it scan-based kind of mobile computing, to maybe voice picking, to maybe some sort of goods to person robotic picking, to then full-blown automation where you have kind of goods to robot, not even goods to person, where it's a, a, a ASRS type system with a robotic arm picking that. And that's probably kind of the furthest level of, of automation that we would see in that kind of picking or order fulfillment environment where it truly is completely humanless, but not many organizations kind of are at that level of automation. But you really need to look at each workflow, which is how we kind of consider that, where that was picking and then there's another path for receiving, like unloading and receiving, and another for packing and shipping, and another for replenishment that, you really need to understand what the pain points are for each customer, where they're kind of either struggling with their throughput, uh, where they have bottlenecks, where they have quality issues. And unless they're going to be putting in a 50, 100, $150 million entire new site, you got to find those individual workflows and what level of automation works for them, given their size of business, their budget, the return that they're looking for. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree. I, I don't think... Uh, people are going anywhere anytime soon from the barcoding perspective. Um, but that's actually the way barcoding, that's what we like to look at this too. We like to meet people where they are and phase folks in um, and, and really understand which of those workflows are going to return the most value um, that we can kind of get started in and, uh, and then kind of move it through there. So yeah, we're, we're, we're on the same page <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, I, I would love to put on kind of our futurist hats and we've started to kind of talk a little bit about this, um, but obviously we started here, me, me talking all about the future is now um, with Honeywell. So let's, let's dive into a little bit more of what we see in the longer term in the future. Um, and this is things that, you know, from a barcoding perspective, I'll throw it out there. We still always believe in starting with process first and understanding the people component. And then we jump into the tech. All that said, disclaimer said, let's dive into the tech. <laughs> We've got the CTO right. here, let's dive into the tech. So um, let's start with like the big, the big, big question, right? AIDC, which is our industry, uh, the data capture, automat automated data capture industry. What are you seeing starting to bubble up to the top and maybe think about more of like a 10 year time frame? Yeah. Um, well, first and foremost, I would say um, kind of multimodal and collaborative. So historically, if you look at the AIDC industry, it has been barcode based. Yeah. It's <laughs> scanning barcode, it's printing barcodes, it's mobile computers reading barcodes, where occasionally you may do some OCR with the, the, the scan engines. RFID has been the next greatest thing for the last, I don't know, 20, 25 really? years. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, but again, making more and more headway. To me, where I see this industry going is that multimodal in the sense that you're going to start seeing a little bit more wearable technology come in. You're gonna start seeing some AR, VR for certain use cases. It's not gonna be the panacea that maybe everyone thinks, um, but there's absolutely good use cases for augmented reality or virtual reality. Um, AMRs, robotics are gonna start playing a bigger role. And again, not necessarily fully displacing a person, but 
How are you augmenting and complementing and making them more productive? So whatever technology they're using, whether it's a mobile computer, AR, VR glasses, voice system, that's going to now have to integrate and orchestrate with a, with a robot as well. So that's really kind of where, where I see and we see the AIDC industry going is um, moving a little bit more towards wearable tech to equip every person, uh, collecting that data to be able to drive really the digital twin of a person. What are they doing throughout the day to come back to what you said? How can it be more people and process oriented? Improve your processes by having that right set of data, retain your people by understanding more as far as what they're doing and how to improve their engagement. Um, and that kind of data is gonna be the, the core foundation as you look at the, the surrounding technologies. Yeah, I love that. Um, GW, look like you wanna jump in there too, so. I do, uh, you know, <laughs> as we talk about this tech, you know, the, this is the next 10 years of, of where we're gonna go. Uh, you know, on the on the shorter term window, and I know we've already defined what we consider shorter term, that's whatever anybody wants to say is shorter term. But, you know, the, the speed of this coming to market, I mean, where do you see us in the next two or three years? What do you see the, the big initiatives, what's going to drive right now that that's going to be new? I mean, obviously, we're still scan guns. Uh, you know, whether it's, you know, full touch or whether it's uh, just the standard RFID gun that everyone's there. What do you see the next generation of that starting to look like? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, one, the question is kind of next generation scan gun. Yes, that'll happen. And, and obviously that could be kind of 5G based and how can you take more advantage of the capabilities of the 5G kind of wireless infrastructure with kind of latency, which drives more augmented reality options uh, or uh, looking at uh, advanced locationing type systems, uh, which really haven't been or possible, I'll call it. They've been around, but kind of the, uh, the investment required to get indoor locationing ha has been a challenge. So as some of that 5G technology comes out, that'll enable a little bit more. But I mean, I, I think it's really like, what is next over the next two to three years that that isn't a mobile computer or isn't a scanner or isn't a wearable scanner that, that Honeywell's exploring. And again, what excites me is some of that software that I talked about, because regardless of what physical device Honeywell or anyone comes out with that workers are using, that data is what's gonna be key. And that's something that Honeywell is working on, enterprise performance management, where we're taking all of that data comprehensively which is the benefit of what I talked about with kind of that HCE organization mm -hmm. where we're pulling in the asset data from uh, warehouse automation equipment. We're pulling in the asset data from our types of devices, mobile computers, barcode printers. We're pulling in worker data from our voice picking and this kind of new task management for the kind of unplanned or unscheduled tasks. And couple that with actually building data as well with our building technology group. So those kind of four areas where you have building kind of assets, both kind of fixed and mobile IT, as well as worker, that's unique to Honeywell where we can digitize your entire operations and look at what type of machine learning, AI intelligence can proactively do the typical stuff like predictive maintenance, but really look at how can you orchestrate, coordinate, and make those process improvements that get your entire system and your entire warehouse throughput to a whole new level. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense that companies like ours uh, in the data capture space would would you know want, would be at the front of, of being able to take that data and take it to the next level. Um, I love that. I think Honeywell has provided some great leadership on that front. And um, I know barcoding, we look forward to collaborating um, on the software side of, of the world with our platform and Teletrack. So yeah. um, love hearing that and, uh, and, and I can't wait to see where that goes. But yes, you're right. The data, you know, collecting the data is, is important only and only if you use it, mm -hmm. right? To make good decisions for your business. So yeah. like, just yeah. absolutely love that. The, the throw it out there, there's somebody, Jody, at your company that <laughs> 
to do a Fitbit reference. And oh, I know who that is. When you when you grab all that da the data, it's what can you do with it? I mean, there's I mean, it's all available. And to hear that we're two or three years out or sooner to have that information to pull it together and to be able to start using that uh, is exciting for for all customers in this space. Uh, so Taylor, thanks for that. Uh, but yeah, you know, when we talk to Matt, we'll make sure yeah. you, you copy. Shout right out, Matt Cunningham. Copyright that I used it again yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I so we we touched upon you know we touched upon data. Um, we touched upon you know kind of the labor market drivers, of course, from um, the standpoint of wearable technologies. Um, we touched briefly on connectivity, which I think you rightfully so pointed out, kind of is a main driver for these technologies that we want to enable, right? We can't really do a lot if we don't actually have connectivity. So yeah, so, yeah. do you wanna expound a little bit more on kind of Honeywell's perspective there? I mean, obviously there's a lot of chatter um, in the market on the connectivity side. On connectivity, yeah. Um, look, I think, we're, I think we're on a journey and I guess to go back to the kind of changing or adaptability. I mean, we've been through 2G, 3G, 4G, coming on 5G, um, everyone thinks it's revolutionary. And look, there, there's absolutely new use cases that are gonna be kind of thought of that frankly, myself, you, kind of anyone on this call, like, haven't thought of yet. Like there's, I mean, what, what 4G enabled in the smartphone, no one really thought of Uber being possible, like going into coming out with 4G in, in an Apple iPhone. Um, so there'll absolutely be use cases that, that we can't even sit and think of here, but um, I mean, we are seeing kind of interest in that, that 5G, really private 5G, uh, mm. a little bit more to look at kind of augmenting or, or even replacing kind of wireless infrastructures, particularly for large hybrid facilities. And by hybrid, I mean, indoor and outdoor. So think of large yards or ports or airline area, uh, airports. Uh, so we're getting some customer interest in that area, but frankly, a lot, a lot of interest around Wi-Fi 6, because you get a lot of the same benefits as far as speed and um, kind of bandwidth with a kind of traditional Wi-Fi infrastructure. So, I mean, those two technologies, coupling with kind of maybe ultra wide band or other types of lower cost, longer range cellular connectivities for IoT based uh, use cases uh, will kind of all come together uh, to really bring uh, that data, as we talked about, essentially to, to at least bring the opportunity to customers and technology providers and partners like barcoding to look at how they can take that data and bring value back uh, to the customer for their operations. Yeah, well said. Um, I, I definitely think the, the partnership aspect of this is more important than ever. So um, it will be a collaborative effort of what what we can do with this data. Um, yeah. Don't sleep on Wi-Fi six too. I heard that. So yeah. <laughs> well, and, and partnership is key, like you just said. I mean, I, I can't stress that enough. That in today's world, no one can really go it alone. I mean, yeah. you you have to partner, whether it's through kind of a technology partnership because you can't develop everything fast enough. Whether it's through a go to market and a channel partnership, because clearly. Uh, people may not have the span to, to hit a customer base, whether it's customer partnership, right? How do you get customer feedback through that product development and what solutions yeah. are next and what data insights make sense uh, or university developments for some advanced tech uh, work and those partnerships like that? That's absolutely critical and in, in an area that, that Honeywell invests to with our VC fund to stay close to some startups and yeah, so partnerships are, are absolutely key in this dynamic world. You know, my, my, it may not be common knowledge that you guys have a VC fund. Hmm. Want to talk a little bit about that? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. A um, couple of years ago, I'm not sure exactly how many, but um, our CEO set aside a, a fund and actually a team where uh, we invest in, I would say, startups, but not necessarily like first year, a little bit mature startups and, and really for kind of a couple of purposes. One is to keep an eye on technology that we think is kind of a good potential partner or complement to our existing portfolio and kind of customer needs. 
Um, and two, to kind of grow and learn and understand how these type of startup companies are able to kind of go to market, expand and, and kind of grow at rapid scale. And um, it, it's been a, a great opportunity for myself personally and, and the numbers at Honeywell, given the different kind of investments uh, that we have made. Um, one, one company as an example is Farai, uh, where we've invested with them, have uh, structured a resell agreement now or kind of through barcoding and others, we're able to bring some pretty advanced last mile delivery and supply chain visibility solutions uh, to our customers that, that have wanted that and also gotten kind of a peek under the covers as far as how they're running their operations and how they grow and scale that you otherwise wouldn't um, with just a normal kind of resale partner agreement. Oh, I really love that. And I think that's probably something new for our audience is, you know, because Honeywell <laughs> is big. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's probably... Uh, pretty cool for people to hear that you guys are also learning from um, kind of those mature startups and, and kind of injecting that kind of new energy into um, a really well-oiled machine. So that's, that's really cool to hear. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I, um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask about my somewhat favorite topic of the moment, which is robots. <laughs> So everyone wants to know about the robots. And again, referencing uh, the Modex trade show that just occurred, there were robots everywhere. Um, tell us, tell us, uh, Taylor at GW, what, what is Honeywell's perspective on the bot revolution? <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess, first of all, robots are, are they going to take over the world is really my <laughs> sub question. But. Do, do we have Skynet coming from Terminator? <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, look, I think robots are going to continue to increasingly play a larger part in our world. I mean, hands down is my belief in, in Honeywell's view. Robots are, are also, or at least kind of the robotic industry is a wide spectrum. Like, are you talking about AGVs or AMRs? Are you talking about robotic arms? Are we talking about kind of collaborative robots that help provide information and kind of have a little digital face and other things. Um, I mean, there's a lot of different types of, of robotic solutions. And um, I mean, that's where our integrated business, uh, business division for warehouse automation um, is, is really investing a lot of time, energy, resource, and, and R&D is uh, in that robotic side. But if you look at our aerospace division, again, Honeywell's big, right? <laughs> like right. you said, we're doing a lot with drone work as well um, and kind of unmanned aircraft and, and other things there. So, I mean, there, there is a lot of different pockets of R&D across Honeywell that's looking at, let's just call it autonomous operation uh, of equipment, whether you call that kind of robotics or not, or um, other type of, um, of system. So maybe getting specific to the the AMR space, which I know is near and dear to kind of the AIDC industry, that, that's an interesting one to us. We see an opportunity there, um, but frankly, there are so many AMR hardware providers that yep. don't really differentiate themselves that much. So right now we're looking at how do we provide value add at the software layer and take our, take our expertise from our voice business where we're already guiding a worker throughout a warehouse facility, we already have integrations to the back end WMS systems. And how do we provide integrations in a platform where if you want to add a robot from whoever's robot provider from an AMR perspective, uh, that we can help navigate the person where to go and the robot uh, as well through kind of interfaces integrations and using the API framework that those robotic hardware companies have. So that's probably a little bit more of our, our strategy within PSS is to help orchestrate and coordinate the robots and not necessarily um, design or manufacture them ourselves right now. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And what I love is it, you know, kind of coming full circle, you're back to making that employee's experience better, right? Yeah. So this is technology that ultimately, um, you know, we kind of came across the board, but um, these are things that are meant to help someone do their job better, right? I mean, really at the end of the day, and, and I even like that concept of um, let's get people out of jobs that 
art as valuable and put them in places where they can really add value and thrive. I know that that's, you know, people will talk and there's lots of chatter about automation, but I think ultimately most business leaders I talk to, that's their end goal, right? They, they don't want to lose valuable people. They just want them doing um, more value added jobs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, I am reaching the end of my, all of the questions that I had on my mind, <laughs> but I really thank you for sitting down with us. I mean, I think we covered a ton of ground. Um, I really want to reinforce that the CTO of Honeywell said, don't go it alone. Um, it's really important to have strong partner ecosystem um, in today's environment. Um, I think that collaboration, that flexibility, and obviously the industry leadership that Honeywell brings to the table is vital to have in your company today. We just can't do without it. So GW, final questions on your list? My, my list has been covered. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to come here and, and do the huddle. Uh, you know, it's important. I really enjoyed to hear where the future of Honeywell is going. I learned some things as well. Uh, nice. So Taylor, thank you for that. <laughs> and, uh, but if there's things we can help you with, we're all here to support. Uh, Jody, thank you for putting this together. Yeah, uh, you're, you're welcome. Can't wait for the next one. Okay, well, we're not done yet because there's always some some last minute questions I like to throw out there. Uh -oh. uh, so the curveballs, the curveballs. The, cur <laughs> the curveballs. Um, so I think, well, we always do an easy one, which is just kind of that that final takeaway. I think it's a nice summary for folks. Um, if, if we think about the future, you know, kind of coming down the pike, the future is now this concept. Um, where, where should companies really invest their time in, and in trying to dive in and research and understand? If you had to point them in one particular direction, where should they spend their time really um, starting to learn? Taylor, uh, as you? far as like what technologies? For the AIDC space, yeah, for the AIDC space. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, I guess I would, I probably flip it around, <laughs> honestly, I like it. kind of like you said, as far as people process technology, like, I wouldn't go focus on technology yet, like learn your operations, not to say that customers don't, but identify like, where is your biggest bottleneck? Like what workflow is it in? Like go out and perform an entire day, like in a warehouse, either the actual work itself or shadowing people, because Typically, what we find, is, and it's true inside Honeywell, those executives, myself included, that are making purchase decisions or directions oftentimes don't know what's happening at the day-to-day the -day level out on the floor and what's really causing the biggest roadblocks to productivity, efficiency, or quality. So for to me, it's first kind of make sure you really understand what uh, are your focus areas for trying to solve and then you can go back because the technology may be AMRs, it may be voice, it may be full-blown automation, but it, it really depends on, you know, could be RFID, like what you're trying to solve though and, and for what purpose. So I would start with kind of operational insight. You passed my test, Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> it was the ultimate curveball. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, music to our ears, it's exactly the way, uh, you know, every every person from barcoding watching this is shaking their head. That's great. Um, I, we, we totally agree. And uh, I think I think it's hard sometimes for all of us in leadership to realize that we don't know where all the duct tape duct tapes being used. And we don't necessarily know everything. Maybe processes that looked really good on the whiteboard don't don't quite work out as well. Yeah. Once they're in place, and uh, I think being humble enough to kind of go out there and see what's really happening is is definitely a great piece of advice. GW, anything from your side in terms of advice for our audience? No, I, I look at what's out there. You know, Taylor said it earlier. There are a lot of resources out there to help you in these spaces. So when you're getting ready to do a project like this, the barcoding team is going to take you through these steps. You know, the manufacturers are going to be out there to assist you as well. So don't go at it alone. Uh, you know, reach out to resources and, you know, just because something worked at one place isn't going to work everywhere. This, there's no part of this technology that's a one size fits all. So there's going to be parts and pieces and in, in design a solution that's going to work best and, and, and help the particular customer the most when it comes down to that. So a lot of resources that are available. Awesome. All right. Final question. I'm going back to technology, even though I'm not a technologist, but I'm going back there anyway. So the 
coolest piece of technology in your home or the coolest piece of technology you wish was in your home, go. <laughs> I have kids, Taylor, I'll take this one. The ability to be invisible. Uh, I wish I had that technology in my home. Uh, my 10 year old, I could learn all kinds of things. Uh, and as some people know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of low tech, but I'm enjoying the ability uh, up here to be a visitor. All right. So you went, you went superhero technology, right? You went right there. Okay, cool. Yeah. I was going to um, say now, now you've got me trying to think of something that's just as elaborate, but uh, no, no. First thing that comes to mind is fine. No, look, I'm actually more with JW or GW, which is surprising as it's CTO, but I think I'm influenced uh, by my wife, who's kind of a little anti-technology. So I'm not even allowed to have an Alexa because she thinks it's spying on us. Oh, yeah. Um, I understand that. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, I, I would, with that aside, I mean, I would definitely be looking at a kind of full-blown connected home just as far yeah. as a lot of automation programming, some of the IFT type capabilities, all smart appliances, but yeah. unfortunately not the, not there given um, I <laughs> prefer a marriage today. and I love my wife. <laughs> <laughs> not in the cards today, not in the cards. Yeah. No, all, all good stuff. You know, I always like to throw that last curveball out there. I'm also super low tech, so I didn't even want Wi-Fi and I got overruled on that. So I also <laughs> love my husband and <laughs> I, I will bend as well, but yeah. Um, really appreciate Honeywell um, sponsoring this huddle. Taylor, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, we wish you much success in the CTO role and thank you for spending um, an hour of your time with us. Um, GW, thank you so much for putting this all together and, and participating in the discussion. We really appreciate it. Uh, for all of you who love this conversation and want to hear more of them, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel on uh, Bark to Search Barcoding Inc. Um, obviously, you, if you have questions that you uh, would like to ask myself or our panelists, you can reach out to us on barcoding.com. And finally, of course, if you just want to work with us, which is the best case scenario, um, same thing, barcoding.com, reach out, um, follow us, like us, whatever kids say these days, hit the subscribe button. Um, but we, uh, we look forward to talking to you in the future. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Hi, did you enjoy the huddle? I sure hope so. We were really excited to have you as part of our conversation and would love to continue it. If you have a question or a challenge that you're facing and barcoding can help you out, please reach out. You can contact us on barcoding.com anytime or any of our social media channels. Again, we're, we are here to help and would love to chat with you. Final ideas, did you like the huddle so much you wanted to join? Do you wanna come on air with me? Do you know someone who would be a great fit or a topic that you'd like to see covered? If so, reach out to me um, via email or LinkedIn, and I am happy to uh, check in with you and, and talk through what we might be able to accomplish together. I would love to hear your ideas. We're always looking for new topics. So if you have an idea for Huddle or you'd like to be on the Huddle, contact me and we will make it happen. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye.